All right. Hello, hello, and welcome to our Amplified Solutions webinar. Uh, yeah. My name is Lee Adkins. I will be your co-host today, along with the wonderful Chris McDonough. What's going on, Chris? Hey, not a whole lot. Excited to talk about business plans today. Indeed. And not just any business plan, a team business plan. Chris, why does a team business plan matter? Like we talk about doing individual plans and production numbers and all that stuff, but why would you want a team business plan? So organizing your team will help you to unite everyone around your common goals. So just like you would create an SOP for how you would want a certain lead, a new buyer lead to come in for your team, you do have one of those, don't you guys? Uh, but <laughs> if you don't, go ahead and make one. But it unites everyone around a common goal. It creates a dialogue that allows you to explore things because we all know the basics. You have to generate leads in order to sell houses. You have to prospect and cultivate those leads. But there's so many other things. And getting it down on paper at the beginning of the year, or even better, at the December or November before the beginning of or the year. January 23rd is fine. <laughs> will allow you to unite everyone around the same sheet of music so that you are orchestrate. I'm going to go with the musical metaphor like daily just for you. It's going to unite everyone around this so that everything's orchestrated and going the same direction because you can change tack if you're if the market shifts or if something happens in your area, a natural disaster, anything can happen, but getting everyone going in the same direction is super important and it's part of the evolution of a team. As you grow, as you expand, you get more and more organized and you need something like this at your foundation. Absolutely. So we'll dive into that in just a quick second. We've got a guide that we'll share with you. It's downloadable, printable, fill it out, use it yourself, share it with people. Um, but Chris, first and foremost, what does our company Amp Amplified Solutions do? And what do you do with that company? And then I'll give my <laughs> short version and we'll, we'll go. <laughs> Great. Well, I am the COO of Amplified Solutions and we help people organize and manage their follow-up boss accounts. So we build out your follow-up boss account with you with our best practices that's customized to the way you practice real estate. And then we put you in a program called account management. And we have people inside your account helping you keep your data integrity high, helping you manage your leads, nudging your agents to ensure that everything is being worked around the system that you've all agreed upon. And then we give you really actionable insights about the data that we have inside your account, what you can do better, different, what action plans are working well, which ones are not. And we help you fine tune those uh, knobs and also big swings in your follow-up boss account so that you can make the most out of your investment and help your agents produce at a really high level with this amazing piece of technology. Lovely. And I'm the chief partnership officer, which mostly means I work with other vendors and other people to uh, develop relationships with them. And um, yeah, so focused on you know, operations and CRM management. I'm going to drop a link to our YouTube channel as well in the chat real quick. Uh, check that out if you're not yet subscribed. We've got all kinds of training videos teaching you how to do things as a leader owner, a, a, videos you can use with your agents for training, all kinds of stuff. It's all free. Um, check it out. So diving into the business plan, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Do you see there it now? I Love do. It. There she is. So here is said guide, um, guide to creating a team business plan. The reason this is so important, and, and I'm not going to go deep into a bunch of examples. I've done this a lot and it's incredibly valuable. You know, a couple of years ago, there was all the big, like, start with why the Simon Sinek stuff and, you know, there's always a North Star, people doing mission, vision statements forever. And there's a good reason. It really helps. I, I told a quick story earlier and I'll give the short version of it. But when I used to chair committees, I would always come the first meeting with a, like at our association, always come with a mission statement that wasn't very good with the intent that we could work on it together. Um, and it was amazing how uniting it was really early to work on it together. This is our mission for the year for this committee. 
look at it at the beginning of every meeting and then rock on. You never even really talk about it again. It's just kind of there and it's a reminder and you're like, right, that's why we're doing this or that's how we're doing this. Mm -hmm. um, so Chris, I know you've added some things here. We're not going to read this to everybody, but um, you know, just having a really short mission statement. I love that you included the Starbucks miss mission statement. It's actually really hard to write a good mission statement. And if you've never done this before, give yourself some grace and it's okay if it's not amazing. The fact that you spend a little time thinking about it is actually a, la a huge part of the value. Yes. And that, to your point earlier, bringing in something that's intentionally not what you ultimately want to go with. Uh, that's kind of the idea behind presenting you all with this guide. It's if I said, all right, I need you to go and make a business plan for your team. It's hard to start with a blank piece of paper. So we want to provide you with the prompts and some definitions and like the Starbucks mission statement. It's always easier to replicate something in your own style than it is to just come up with something out of thin air. So we wanted to put this together for you to help you along your way to make this better organized team, because you're going to think of things that aren't on here. You're going to think of ways to do things better, but this is to get you started and to get something concrete on paper. Absolutely. And again, the beauty of this is it can, it, it's a draft, like print it out. It's a workbook, print it out, write on it, scratch it out. I don't like that word. Go to thesaurus.com and like find some other words, like whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, but I can't, I can't, I don't think overemphasize how much it is, especially again, if you've never done this or you haven't done it since you were in eighth grade or whatever, like just, you know, make some bullets, think about things. Obviously a good group exercise um, as stated, if you have a leadership team or a management team uh, can be a really good thing. One thing you could do is have everybody come up with one and they get together and consolidate or, or talk through. Um, so a mission statement is important. A mission statement is kind of more of a purposeful, like, what are we doing here? Mm -hmm. But a vision statement is a little more of like aspirational, change the world type of stuff. Right. Uh, Chris, do you want to add any like real estate wise, like what would it like vision statement type type of thing be? So when you think about your mission statement, that's your why. And then your vision statement is the what. So what are you doing because of the why? So for Amazon's example, we're going to be the world's most customer centric company where customers can find and discover anything they might want to buy online. So if I'm starting my real estate company, I would say I aspire to be the world, the world's not the world's most I'm reading right. instead of talking uh, the the Charleston area's foremost real estate team for luxury listings. So getting super specific about what it is you aim to do. So you want to be specific so that you and the people in your company know this is who we're going for. And this seems a little hokey. I'm a feelings person. I can talk about feelings and emotions all day long. But if you present me with an exercise like this, I'm going to go, this is stupid. I don't want to do this. But it's so important to do these exercises because everything you do is going to come back to this mission. It's going to come back to this vision. And if you're marketing to everyone, you're marketing to no one. Someone uh, who's smarter than I am once said, nobody fangirls over the great value or the up and up brand. And that's very true. You're, you want something that is uh, that niche where you can not, um, not repel other people, of course, but getting really specific because if you have something that's specific, you're going to get excited about it for those reasons. Yeah. And I think similar, you know, I use this excuse a lot with follow boss in particular as a tool. It's a great way to say like, if it, if that doesn't integrate with follow boss, we don't need it. Mm -hmm. This is the same type of feel, right? It's like our focus is this. Our mission is to help 200 families, you know, whatever. And if you're like, oh, well, oh, I had this cool idea. We're going to go do this thing. We're going to do an event about whatever. And you're like, wait, does that does that fit with our mission? 
So it should really be prescriptive in that sense. And Chris, I want to lean into that too, because I can see a lot of people, especially real estate people being like, this is stupid. I don't want to <laughs> think about how I feel about whatever, like a mission statement is dumb. This is dumb. I promise you, if you, if you haven't done this, like give it a shot. And you know, I've said this a lot, but I used to do my goals with my agents when I ran a team. And what was amazing is they do their goals. They mm -hmm. turn them into me and literally forget them. I'd pull them out six months later and they'd be like, oh my God, we're doing all those things. It's the same type of thing. You're putting it into the universe. It's not so much that you're, you know, necessarily going to put this up on a TV in your office and like read it every day. Although you could. You very uh, well could. <laughs> but, you know, now getting a little more practical stuff, differentiating factors from your competitors. This is really important. And I think a lot of us think we know this, but we don't really come at it from a online research or a consumer perspective or things like that. They're just like, oh, we're better than them or they're stupid. They only have four agents that actually sell anything or whatever. But what's the actual perception in that difference? And what matters to you? Like, do you want to have a lean four agent team that just absolutely crushes it? Like, awesome. That's one like specific thing. If you want to have the biggest team there and only 50% of people are producing, great. That's a strategy. So just being really clear on that, where you're different. And this informs marketing, it informs recruiting, it informs, you know, exactly. lead conversion, like everything. People are going to come to you and your team because of the reasons that you're different. If Lee and I have uh, teams in the same area and we practice in very similar ways, it's going to be those differences that pull people from one, well, Lee's team does this, so I'm going to them, but Chris's team does this, so I'm going to go to them instead. So writing these down, being very clear on what makes you different, as Lee said, that's going to help you market to those differences. That's going to help you identify how to generate leads because of those differences, because that is what makes you unique. And if you're just like everyone else, then you're going to blend in and you really want to stand out in your market. Because even with the thinning of the herd of the market of the last year, it's still a pretty crowded marketplace. So, and people are getting into real estate every day. So leaning into those differences is really going to help set you apart. Yeah, absolutely. And I think more than ever, like being clear about this, like, A, why are you doing it? You know, again, I know I said it earlier, but stuff can go in a listing presentation. It can go in, you know, there's a lot of places to use um, this intel. We didn't get too crazy th with this. We've actually got some deeper, more complicated things here, but we wanted to keep this really simple. Um, just understanding your local market, um, A, just to have it down, B, if you actually are going to do this every year or every quarter, you're going to have some historical data um, to do that. Uh, it could be used as a great educational tool for your team. Hey, by the way, average days on market is 52 days in this price range or in this area. Uh, you know, it's currently showing that it's a seller's market, like all of those things. Again, you can certainly leverage these to like train your team, like get this data down and then share it with everybody. And I, I feel like, so the team that I helped, I was the broker in charge of a team here in Charleston, and we grew from about 50 agents to 225 at our peak. And I don't feel like we often enough sat around and talked about, okay, what's what's too much in the market? What are we seeing too much of? What are we seeing not enough of? And if anything, these are going to create conversations with your, you and your leadership team to help identify where there's a need for a service because a lot of other teams probably aren't sitting around to do this. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, again, as part of market, you know, who are your competitors? Why are they a competitor? Like, do you think they are? Are they actually? Um, and what are they doing well? I think that's an important thing to really uh, look into. You know, even if it's just like, hey, I'm just going to have a different strategy. Like, cool, they do billboards. I'm going to do 
post or radio or whatever post. Uh, we're just making up words today. <laughs> Not mail, we're gonna we're gonna put it in the post. We're gonna fly an airplane yeah. with the thing hanging right. behind. I'm gonna send some carrier pigeons over there. <laughs> um, and then the gaps in real estate service locally. This is a really brilliant, fantastic one, especially with models changing and commission lawsuits and all the stuff going on. Um, it's be yeah. a good time to to do some of these. I think this too is so important. Um, I saw this the other day and it was actually funny because it was it was a joke kind of. Um can't remember who it was, but it said it said we specialize in everything. <laughs> and I well, was like, that's not how it works. Great. <laughs> what does that mean? So when you come to this section, it's this again is going to be one of those exercises where you think I don't want to create an avatar, a client persona. And this is really important because here too, if I say my ideal client is a millennial first time home buyer that is starting a family, or my ideal client is a retiree empty nester looking to downsize. Getting so specific about who your ideal client is and why will help you market to them. Because if that ideal client is the retiree, you're going to want to shift your marketing language. Do some to TikTok be, ads. It'll be great. Yeah. <laughs> Probably not going to advertise on TikTok, although maybe it's better, it's more popular than it's ever been. So you're going to that's going to inform your the the words that you choose to market to them. It's also going to inform the way you market to them. You're probably going to be more successful with mailing something to their house rather than putting something on TikTok. So again here, I know it, I don't want you to roll your eyes at these exercises. Take them seriously and get it down because the uh, don't as leaders we often assume that everyone else on our team understands what we do, or they would do what we would do in any other pre, uh, situation. And that causes miscommunication. It causes blurred lines and conflict. So getting this down so that everyone is in agreement and excited about it, that's really going to help everyone on your organization. Because if you're a team lead and probably on this call for teams, you have different people in different seats. So you have a marketing person, you have a listings person, you have a sales manager, you have an admin. If everyone is congruent on these things, it's going to help your overall organization flow better. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's funny. I think getting creative about this is really smart. I was thinking about some other ideas kind of, as you mentioned that, and I was thinking about, you know, People like people with interests similar to them. So if like dog, people that like dogs, like that could be a really smart market share. You could post your dogs on social media all the time. Hey, we're at the dog park. Meet people, VA loans, like any number of things, segments. And again, I, I know that people all the time, especially people new to the industry are always like, well, what if, you know, what if it is? I don't want to not do sell a mansion to somebody if they want a mansion because I'm marketing to first time home buyers. And we all know it doesn't work that way. Uh, <laughs> okay. But having those segments is just really smart. And I would encourage you to get creative with that. Like, I actually just thought of the dog thing. You know, they have the like walking distance to Whole Foods or Starbucks, like all those sort of things. Like, think about what those are. And those do influence both your personal brand and that brand. Plus, again, it informs who you actually want to work with. Right. And in this, you'll see the questions asked, who do you who do you really resonate with? Who do you like if you're pounding out phone calls and you talk to 40 people in a day, who is it on the other end of the line that you typically connect with? Well, if you've been in the business long enough, you're going to see patterns in that. You're going to see who really is attracted to you because of the way you speak, because of the way you present yourself, because of your branding. And that, you know, you want to lean into that because you're already hitting it out of the park. So it will allow you asking these introspective questions will allow you to flush out that information so that you can dig a little bit deeper on the things that are working. And that's not to say that 
if you specialize in helping people get into new construction homes or you specialize in those first time home buyers that's not to say that you don't want to try a luxury division at some point go ahead keep 80% of your resources going towards what's working well and try 20% on them on the the risk the let's give this a shot and if it starts to get some legs reallocate funds and maybe you can expand that luxury division but it's it's you're not going to be for everyone and trying to be for everyone is foolish <laughs> so this helps you narrow down who you are for because that those are the people that like the way you speak when lee and i do separate uh speaking engagements he has a completely different audience than I do. And that's good because we, we both work for the same company and we can draw those people in separately. Absolutely. That's a great example. Yeah. And then across the team, of course, even better because you are potentially going to have different divisions. But again, who is that core audience that you're going to spend marketing dollar on and verbiage and SEO right. and time finding those people? Um, it's just better than all of Facebook. Whoever wants to click this picture, and put their email <laughs> whoever likes this before. one house will be my customer. Right. And one more thing before we move on. So when we were talking about the why in the beginning, that helps you to create a story around, around your brand. Some of the best salespeople that I know and have come to know are those storytellers. You don't want to be the story of your brand to be like, well, I I failed at corporate life, so I gave real estate a shot. That's not an endearing story. If you have a story about my life changed, I got into real estate because of this, it affected my family in this way, it's changed my life in this way, uh, I love it because I change other people's lives in this way. I mean, I didn't even use any specifics in that made up story. And that's much more compelling than, well, I don't know, I'm just in real estate. Right. So getting these things out helps you to be that storyteller through your marketing, through the scripts that you give to your people to share about why you're doing this. And Absolutely. that will help you attract more business. Absolutely. So now I have all that, but going a little more into profitability, generally speaking. So resources, you know, what do you currently have? Again, this is great. It informs your marketing and informs your recruiting and informs everything. Um, so what resources do you currently have? Um, and to this point, you know, staff is included or we have this or we have a third party that helps you get whatever set up. Uh, all good things. What resources we need to add? Also, I should mention this. We intentionally use the word team or company somewhat interchangeably. I'm sure everybody knows, like, if you're legally a brokerage, like, this all <laughs> still applies. We just try to be somewhat consistent with our verbiage. Yes. Um, but so what resources we need to add? And again, tied back to your mission and or vision statements. If our, you know, part of our mission or our goals are to gain an agent count, then this is going to be a thing and it's going to cost you money. And a lot of times it's going to cost you money before you make money off of them. So then digging more into overhead and expenses. Um, and again, we didn't want to get into a crazy full on profit and loss scenario here, but you know, what are your key expenses here and are they generating money for you? Are they at least branding or are they, are they doing something? Um, again, try, sometimes just putting them in one place to be able to look at them all and go, oh yeah, I forgot. We're still, we're still paying for whatever, or we should probably get rid of that. <laughs> yeah. And try to include, go back. If you have a credit card that you use to put all your company expenses on, dig that up and look. So kind of like how I do my budget at the house. I don't just say, okay, these are my utilities. This is my mortgage. This is my car payment. I spend more money than just that every month. I spend money on going out to eat. I spend money on gas. I spend money on late night Amazon purchases when I can't sleep. Like try to add everything that you spend money on but so it will accurately refl reflect your actual budget. Because if you say, oh, well, my 
my office space rent is this and I pay this much for leads and my utility bills this and here's this is how much I pay for the courier or whatever. That's not an exhaustive list. Include the dinners that you take your agents out to. What's your budget for that? So obviously there's not enough lines to do that. Uh, you're probably going to want to throw that on a spreadsheet. But be smart with your budgeting and include all those nitty gritty things so that you can plan for them. Yeah. And again, this is more planning. I certainly hope that you have a profit and loss. If you don't, you should at least get like a mint or a, I guess mint's going away. Uh, <laughs> wave apps. Like there's a bunch of free things where you can at least sort of generate your own P&L from your bank account. Um, but yeah, again, this is more planning and forecasting and focused on that. Um if you have an actual PL, then you can use that here. Hopefully it's beautifully categorized and, and works well. So also setting goals for transactions as well as recruiting for your company. And again, if your recruiting goal is zero or one or whatever, that's fine. We're not saying you have to, you know, have a bajillion people. But again, just setting those goals. And again, Chris, I know we've talked some about this just internally and, and all the above. Like the focus on these things is great. So if you're like, hey, you know what? Q1, I'm not focused on recruiting at all. Awesome. Put in zero. Like that's mm -hmm. also clarity. Sometimes it's as much what not to do as it is what to do. Um, so there's no shame in any of these things being zero um, unless you make them zero for multiple years in a row. Yes, <laughs> for sure. Um, so yeah, thinking about um, splits in relation to that. I think a lot of people got into this business with a team model that maybe wasn't wholly fleshed out. And I know a lot of people now who are kind of like, Hmm, I don't know if I'm making, an, I'm, am I making enough money for this to make sense right? with these people? And it's something, again, you may have to investigate or uh, revisit, you know, yearly or, or biannually or something. Um, but Chris, you want to tackle that? That's definitely more of a you topic too. Yeah. So you want to, the whole purpose of starting a team, unless you're supremely altruistic and you want to help other people practice real estate at your own cost, is to help you get out of the grind, build up other agents and share those resources so that everyone can succeed together. So you want to set your splits at a level where it's a win-win for everyone. You as the team lead, you want to cover your expenses as best as you can. You want to profit from this, whether you're in production or in flux or out of production. So considering those things, but you also want it to be a win-win for your agents. Some teams are boasting that, oh, our agents sell 50 plus houses a year. But when you ask them how much money they're making, you're like, oh, you could go work elsewhere and sell 10 houses a year and make more money. So there, you want them to be able to sell as many houses as they want through the resources that you have, but you don't want to set it so that they have to sell 50 houses in order to make a good living. So finding that balance of uh, you getting what you want and it being advantageous to share the resources that you have and have competitive splits. Absolutely. Is very important. Absolutely. So, and a personal lead policy. What is yeah. what is the definition of a personal lead, Chris? Yep. So your sphere leads, your personal leads, everyone's probably going to have a different policy around this. Um, so if you're a team lead, I'm guessing you're buying leads for your team to some degree. What is that definition? What's required for the personal lead? How do you define that? How do you, do they have a different split? And just creating a policy around it so that there's transparency and there's clarity on what to do, both for the agents who are trying to determine how much they're going to get paid at the end of the day, uh, but also for your marketing efforts as well. Is this something you really want your agents to pursue or do you want them to just stick to the leads that you're providing for them? Absolutely. Good, good to be clear. And then again, some of these things should back inform your agent agreement or your company handbook or whatever. Still, still eating that elephant. Um, 
So yeah, so overall now you've got these pieces. So turning that into uh, an accountability plan, you know, things like we're going to have quarterly meetings about this or every month we're going to review this, just setting setting up um, a plan to do this. So having a list of them is step one. And then step mm -hmm. two is figuring out how to do each of those things. If you want to do a CRM audit every quarter, great. If you want to do quarterly one-on-ones or set minimum production standards, you know, starting this year, great. Those are all great things, um, but getting them down. And again, to Chris's point earlier, like maybe some of them are now, maybe some of them are next quarter, maybe some of them are by the end of the year. Um, but again, just designing a, a, a plan um, that, you know, and it's going to change as you go. It's probably never going to end the year perfectly as to what you all fill it out, but you're going to have a lot more intention mm -hmm. uh, with some, some written direction. So and then lead flow is a really important thing as well. Are is everybody getting listing leads? Is nobody getting listing leads? Or if people are, you know, keep smart list zero, can they stay on leads or they come off if they get behind? Do you have a vacation policy if they're out of office? What happens to the leads? So there's actually a lot to this. I think a lot of people see this and they're like, I don't know, we just go around robbing everybody in the team. It's like, <laughs> well, yeah, but. <laughs> you don't want the guy that just got his license two weeks ago to get your five million dollar right. luxury lead right. uh, because that's probably not the best hands to put it in. But you do want to make it fair. You know, you do want to allow for those avenues for people to rise up into those upper echelons. Yeah. Um, you know, to so if you say, OK, we only have two listing agents on the team. Great. What are the steps that you need to take in order to get on the listing team because you probably have a whole lot of talent um and it's uh it it helps you grow in your market when you have a larger listing team and yep. you can train more people to do do that task yep. do that work and it helps with retention and recruiting agreed so marketing plan, I know we talked a little bit about this earlier, but again, a focus on what platforms, hey, my people are on Instagram, hey, we're not going to do Facebook anymore or whatever that is, um, but being focused on those platforms. And again, platform can be a postcard in the mail, doesn't have to be a social media app, <laughs> but again, just getting focused on that. And of course, this ties back to things like budget as well, if you're doing either sponsored posts or some retargeting. Um, or whatever. So platforms you're going to use, how often will you post? This is super important. And we've got a link here to, um, I never clicked the link. So, oh, there you go. A HubSpot one, even better, even cooler. Yeah. This is actually the one that I use for Amplified Solutions. So nice. <laughs> I Beautiful. figured I wouldn't reinvent the wheel and just share the one that we use. Love it. Love it. No, that's great. So yeah, just having some, again, clarity around that allows you to delegate it or automate it. Or uh, instead of wishing you were posting on Instagram three times a week, you could schedule it or delegate it or come up with the calendar. Training plan, teams, meetings, um, you know, frequency on this, something I know, I feel like Chris, you and I have talked a lot about the congruency and consistency in these, both in the, both in the scheduling of them, as well as the format. Mm -hmm. really aids an adoption and people showing up and being engaged. If it's a different thing every time, if sometimes it's a great meeting and you do a bunch of training and sometimes everybody just talks for 30 minutes and then you leave, that's not going to create a consistent culture. If every time you come in, hey, five minutes, everybody tell a quick story or give a win for this week. Great. Everybody's engaged. Now we're going to do some training. Now here's a cool article that I shared. Hey, let's look at some market stats y'all go sell a house. That consistency, both of scheduling and a format, really helps people actually come and adopt those meetings and learn things and, you know, actually participate. So and using that formula at the leadership level is helpful as well. So just like if you send out a newsletter every week, you're going to hold this meeting regularly, having that agenda of what you're going to say and why is going to help you just like this. You're not sitting down to a blank piece of paper going, well, I don't know what I want to talk about. So yes, it will shift. Maybe there's something you tried out that is a hit. You want to add it to your agenda forever. 
Uh, but keeping that going is really good. And it also allows you, if you have it written out, you can share it to the people who weren't able to meet the, make the meeting so that they are able to get that information from you as well. And pro tip, I probably shouldn't share this nor say it out loud, but <laughs> one of the best things about having that kind of consistent format and agenda, it actually, don't hear me wrong here, it actually takes less planning. You can mm -hmm. theoretically show up for the meeting. And as long as you've got a topic to train on or a whatever fits into that bucket on your agenda, you're not every night before your meeting going, oh my God, what are we going to do tomorrow? It's like, no, we have a formula. Ideally, yeah. if you have other people in the company, maybe they can take a segment of the meeting like, hey, so-and-so is going to do a motivational thing every week or go over the numbers or go over our new listings, like whatever that is. Um but again, just kind of creates that that congruency. But it does truly allow you to not have to reinvent the wheel every week or every month. It's like, right. oh, I just need to come up with a training topic for tomorrow. We'll be good. Yeah, exactly. And that's good advice for anything that you do. Anything that you're doing more than once, even if you do it annually, even if you only onboard one agent a year, make that onboarding checklist. Make those, if you're sending out, hey, every quarter, I send out a client satisfaction survey. You don't want to make it every time. Reuse it. Just read back through and tweak it so that it's updated and relevant and then send it again. I always talk about you're going to, going to want to create a slide instead of stairs everywhere you can. And that's just good business practice. Absolutely. Plus, it's more fun. It is. Um, the noodle so slides. <laughs> exactly. So uh, last but not least, or next to last but not least, um, a bit of like kind of a mini uh, like SWOT analysis type thing. If you don't know, SWOT, SWOT is S-W-O-T, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. It's commonly done in like that grid style thing. Mm -hmm. um, really powerful to do this. I'm actually doing this with a big brokerage right now. And it's actually a lot of fun to really kind of think about like, what are we really good at? What are we actually not good at? What opportunities are out there? Like blank slate, blue ocean. Um, what, you know, so much you could do and just being mindful of, of threats, the market, the lawsuits, NAR stuff. There's a lot of stuff going on right now. You'd be wise to have some threats written down here just to have <laughs> them in the back of your mind. Cause, uh, I guarantee you there are some. So, right. but just again, having these down and, and kind of revisiting these frequently and, and what are we good at? Another thing I like to do. This is my bad for not adding this in here, Chris. Something else I like to do that's similar to this is the start, stop, keep doing type of thing. Mm -hmm. To me, that's a good, just my brain works that way. I'm good at being like, okay, do more of that. Right. Don't do that ever again. And maybe do less of that. Um, but it's, it's, it's almost a similar thing, right? It's like, where are your current strengths? What are, are you leveraging them? Are you using them? Current weaknesses, things to either look out for, patch hire for, get software for, um, and certainly threats are something that we want to be, uh, you want to be caught off guard uh, by threats. So anything to add to that? Um, no, Chris, I stuff? think you nailed it. And this so, last section is, this is not an exhaustive list. That's why there's blank space at the bottom, but it's a list to get you started. So these are your basic SOPs that you and processes that you want to create if you don't have them, but document and refine them. So get them down on paper, make sure everyone understands what needs to be done and when for these things. And any other type of information, uh, things that you do in your business, whether it's uh, recruiting or this type of lead for new construction, or this is what needs to be done for this type of seller or whatever, get it down and document it and start building out that resource library for your team, because it's something that is not going to be born overnight and you can just keep adding to it over time and making it better and better. Absolutely. Yeah. Really important. And again, start simple. Like if you've never done this, start simple. A new buyer lead should be called three times in the first three days or in the first one day or the first two hours or whatever it is. Adjust their stage, 
If you don't reach them, leave them in lead and try again in two days. Just real, real, real simple. Mm -hmm. um, you'll find as you do these, they start to become very complicated and four dimensional. What if it's a buyer lead that also has a house to sell? Or what if it's a, uh, there's always those exceptions, but just starting simple and having these. And another logistical pro tip, um, we won't get into details on this, but something cool you can do in Follow Boss is use something like an automation to create a note for something like this. So you can actually um, you know, use an automation, for example, if a buyer lead comes in. Uh, That's something cool that YLOPO kind of does. Like their notes for priority alerts and things like that come in with a little script. Do mm -hmm. the call this guy, read the notes, call this guy, do this thing. Um, however, what I would encourage you to do is to get some of them down just on paper first. And then you can start to translate them into, oh, okay, every time we get a new lead that has the buyer tag, I want to populate this best practice. Every time we get a new lead that has a seller, I want to. So there's ways to get this info out there. But Chris's point is that you got to gotta figure out what you want before you can uh, ask somebody to do it. Right. And communicate it to your team. Make these resources easy to find. Train on them over and over and over Put again. Put them in your meeting. Put them in your meetings. Yes, because there's so, so many things to remember and things are ever evolving and changing. Well, now we have this tag and now we don't have this tag. So it's really difficult to remember how to do everything perfectly all the time. So having these available for your team is going to give them a place to go instead of walking into your office if you're brick and mortar or texting you going, I don't know what to do. So it's another one of those don't assume everybody knows uh, or thinks to do the same things you would do. Uh, get in your, accept your role as their leader and lead them by making this effort to plan out your business. Indeed. So just a high, high level, quick overview. I'm just starting with a mission vision statement, more of your why and your what. Looking at the market competitors, your market share, your specific niche specializations, marketing message, uh, client persona is such a good idea. And you can have multiples. I wouldn't start with multiples necessarily, but you can have multiples. You can first time buyer and, you know, empty nester move down. Like you don't have to have one. Um, you know, documenting, thinking through more of your resources and expenses, setting some super simple high level team goals. Uh, paying attention to your splits and any sort of company lead versus other leads, uh, the distribution of those leads, executing your marketing, being ready for whatever things the future may bring, and having beautiful written SOPs. If only it was that simple. If only in 45 minutes you could <laughs> come up with all this. <laughs> but we hope it's been helpful to at least have some sort of guide to guide you, to fill in some blanks, to help you think and not just stare at a blank piece of paper. I did drop the link in the chat. We'll also include it with the recording we send out as well as under in the description on this recording. Um, Chris, anything else to add to that? That's it. Thank Just you so it. much. It's not too late. It's not too late. It's not never too late. Too late. <laughs> awesome. And we hope you all have an amazing 2024, although we hope to see you uh, certainly again soon. And y'all, yes. uh, thanks, thanks for checking us out. We'll see you soon. See you later.